actually where should the risk lie? If something does go wrong, if something is found, if there are some problems, where should the risk lie? Who actually manages the, uh, the issues? And then some issues around insurance and the implication from my point of view from part 2A. So just very briefly, what actually happened in Corby? It's been quite well publicised, so I'm going to go through these slides quite quickly. If anyone wants copies of the slides, uh, if you let me have your email address at the end, I'd be more than happy to email you copies of them. So it's just worth remembering, Corby was a steelworks, closed in around about 1980. So around about 600 acres of derelict land, so a huge site. Uh, the Borough Council, again, worth recognising it was a local borough council. This wasn't a large county council, one of the huge metropolitan councils, a small borough council. They purchased the site themselves. They used some European money and they used some uh, government money, but they purchased the site themselves for regeneration. And it was, at the time, the largest regeneration project in the whole of Europe. So this wasn't some large metropolitan council undertaking a town centre regeneration, undertaking a brownfield site regeneration. It was a small borough council undertaking the largest remediation project in the whole of Europe. Uh, there were huge quantities of contaminated material that were being dug up, transported around the site itself and off-site in large uncovered lorries and on public roads. Mud, other material, dust fell from the site and it basically spread throughout the town. And there are a number of comments from the judge in the case talking about uh, residents going to their cars and being able to wipe their fingers across the windscreen because of the dust that had been generated from this site. Uh, 18 families brought an action against the council. It was a class action, so it was a group action by the 18 families. All of these families had children born between 1989 and 1999 and they said that there was a significant cluster of birth defects. Uh, and the court agreed with that. The court actually found that there was a significant cluster of birth defects and that there was a credible link between the birth defects and the exposure to contamination between 1983 and 1997. And this was a finding that the judge said. The judge didn't say that child A's birth defect was caused by the contamination. This was a first stage hearing. All the judge said was that there was a possibility and that there was a link that those children's birth defects could have been caused by the contamination. So the judge said that 16 of these children's claims might succeed and they could go forward to the next stage, which would mean they would actually have to show that their, their individual birth defect was caused by the contamination. Uh, two families, two children who were born after 1997, their claim couldn't go ahead. And so the judge decided that the council was negligent, they breached their statutory duty, and they caused the public nuisance. Now, in this slide, uh, which was written a week ago, I said, where next? Is it going to appeal? What's happening with the, with the mediation? Well, on Friday, uh, the mediation, which the council went into, with the families was completed and the council made a substantial payment to each of the 16 uh, children and paid their legal fees 
and made significantly an apology to the families for the way that the remediation project had taken place. So what that means is it's not going to appeal. The findings of the judge are there. It's good law. It is a precedent for future projects. And there's now no need for those families to prove the direct link between child A and the contamination. So that's where we are. Uh, those of you who are particularly interested and want to read the full judgment, uh, I've given you the reference there. If you want a link to it, I'll send you a, co uh, a copy of the link with your email address. It's just over 200 pages long. It's not the most fascinating bedtime reading, but it does have some quite interesting quotes from the judge about the way the council went about the actual project itself. So what are the lessons to learn? Well, these are some of the things that the court has said. Firstly, the standard that a employer should be demanding and should be carrying out on a remediation project is that of an ordinarily careful, in this case local authority, but it could be of any type carrying out a remediation project, of the nature, judged by the standards known or that in effect should have been known at the time. So you don't need your crystal ball for this. It's not like part 2A where there's retrospective liability and you can have liability now applying today's standards with what was done at the time. So it's very different from part 2A. It is very much what you should have known at the time. The court went on to say that an employer isn't liable for the negligence of their contractors unless that employer was negligent when they actually uh, took on the contractor when they actually employed that contractor in the way that they actually selected or monitored them. Something else that was new in the case, the court turned around and said that an employer can be negligent, negligent for the actions of their contractor if that work involves what the court described as special danger to another. And it did say that dealing with seriously contaminated material involves special danger to workers or the public. So an employer can be liable for the negligence of their contractors when dealing with contaminated material. Now what does that mean from an employer's point of view? Well, you need to be careful when you actually employ a contractor, when you actually decide who's going to carry out the work on your site. So what would I say employers should be doing? And this applies to a local authority, a property developer, anyone who's employing a contractor to carry out a remediation project. Well, you need to know your site. You need to know your site so that you actually employ the right contractors for the job. You've got to look at the experience and qualification of your contractors. You can think about the whole procurement process. Are you actually just employing the cheapest contractor or are you employing the contractors that can do the job? If you employ the cheapest contractor, you could be found negligent. Now that doesn't mean you have to employ the most expensive Rolls-Royce solution, but it does need to be a balancing act between ability to do the job and price. You've got to ensure that they're adequately appoint, appointed using some form of formal appointment process. It's not just a matter of ringing up your mate that you've used before and saying, please remediate this site for me. You've got to actually have a proper uh, consultant employed and, and properly appointed. You do need to think about current standards and remediation methods and making sure that they understand those and that they are going to carry out the work correctly themselves. 
do need to look at what are appropriate and correct levels of liability and insurance and where that's going to lie so that it is known who has liability and who has responsibility. Basically, who takes the risk? It's one of those questions which is rarely asked, but I would say needs to be asked on a more frequent basis. If you're employing a contractor to remediate a site, who's, who takes on the risk of any unknown contamination that is found? That just needs to be talked about beforehand. The consultants will want to price that risk if the risk lies with them. If it's not going to lie with them, and it's going to lie with the employer, the employer needs to know that and needs to be aware that something, if something is found, how they're going to actually manage that. The employer still does need to know their site. They need to ensure that the contract is correctly priced, as does the consultant. And it should make a difference, I would argue. I would say that if a consultant is taking on a full remediation project, they need to know what they're letting themselves in for, and the employer needs to know what they're letting themselves in for. But underlining all of this, is the documentation clear? Is it obvious where that risk is going to lie? Because if at a later stage, a group of residents come along and they sue, the employer or the consultant, they're going to have to look at that contractual documentation as to who should actually be having that risk and who should actually be meeting those liabilities. Let's look at some management issues now. And this is, I think, almost one of the, th the thorniest of questions. If your employer and you're employing a contractor to carry out some work on your behalf, one of the things this judgment says is you can't just wash your hands of the project. Now, for a sophisticated employer with an in-house team, possibly a local authority with a contaminated land officer who at least can manage the consultant in some sort of way, that may be is okay. But actually, if you're a standard employer, don't know anything about the site, don't know a great deal about remediation measures, you've got a problem. Do you end up having to employ a consultant to manage the consultant? And then do you employ a consultant to manage the consultant who's managing the consultant? There clearly needs to be a line drawn. But, but one thing I would say is if you're employing a straightforward remediation contractor and you don't have the in-house expertise, to manage that contractor and manage what they're doing and the way they're going about things, you are going to need to think about having someone between you and the contractor who's actually going to manage the way they work. Because you can't just wash your hands of the project, you can't just turn around and say, really sorry, you know, I'm employing someone, I'm forgetting about it. Because you can have liability as an employer and remember, this act, this the Corby action was built, was bought 15, 20 years after the actual remediation started. In 10 years' time, will your contractor still be around? If not, then you may find that liability rests with you in any event. So you are going to want to know what's being done is being done correctly and being done properly. Now I just want to talk about some mitigation measures and one of the things that you can look at is insurance. Now in terms of insurance there are different types of insurance you can look at. The first thing is and the thing that lots of people get very hot under the collar about, particularly, I have to say, lawyers, who seem to get very excited about the whole concept of PI insurance. I think one of the reasons we get very excited about PI insurance is we're not allowed by law to limit our PI insurance in the way consultants can. The government has turned around and said that it is against public policy for a lawyer to limit their PI insurance to below, I think it's £2 million. 
So the consultants' clauses in their terms and conditions, when they say, well, we'll limit our liability to the value of the project, i.e., if we're charging you 10 grand, we'll limit our liability to 10 grand. By law, we're not allowed to do that. So consequently, lawyers tend to get very hot under the collar about PI insurance. But what I would say is, don't get too excited about PI insurance. It's there. It's important to ensure your consultants have it, and they have an adequate amount of it. But at the end of the day, from the employer's point of view, who is the PI there to protect? Well, somewhat controversially, I would suggest it's not there to protect the employer, it's there to protect the consultant, i.e. if a negligent claim is made against a consultant or a contractor, it's there to protect them, it's not there to protect the employer. So yes, if you're an employer, make sure they've got an adequate level, look at issues as to whether or not it is for each and every claim or whether it is an annual basis. But don't get too excited by it. Actually, you're much better off employing the right consultant who can do the job and then possibly look at some form of specific project insurance. Uh, there is specific project insurance available which will cover not necessarily just the employer but the uh, consultant, the contractor, the employer and we'll look at what work is being carried out and cover for resi any residual liability that may be left for things that can go wrong. It's not particularly cheap, but certainly on larger projects, it is something that's worth looking for. And it can get over that whole argument over levels of PI cover and where should the risk lie. So my final slide relates to land contamination and Part 2A. And what are the implications for the Corby judgment on Part 2A? Well, the first thing is, the Corby judgment dealt with a very heavily contaminated site. What is a Part 2A site? Well, it is a very heavily contaminated site. If you look at the definition of Part 2A, it is a site that can cause the significant possibility of significant harm. Talk about death, disease, genetic mutation. That's the sort, sort of things that Part 2A looks at covering. So Part 2A is a significant uh, site. It is a heavily contaminated site. So it is similar to Corby. The other thing that I've noticed since Corby is all of a sudden residents are becoming more aware of the potential for things to go wrong. I had, I don't know whether it's described as a fortune or misfortune, of being interviewed uh, back in July, uh, the day the Corby judgment came out on both the 6 and 9 and 10 o'clock newsings. Now, it's the first time that a lawyer has been interviewed about land contamination and was the headline story. It provo provoked huge amounts of interest and all of a sudden it was on the front pages of newspapers. So people suddenly became aware of it and they're more aware of what's going on. And yes, I have to say, there are some lawyers out there who are going around to sites that have been remediated in the past and are going around through remediation saying, are you aware you could claim for personal injury? Now, leaving aside what I might think of some of those lawyers, and there are some very good legitimate ones out there, but there are also some real ambulance chasers. And they are all things that you just need to be aware of, and you need to be aware that we ha are having uh, those sorts of projects being looked at. So residents are becoming uneasy, regulators are carrying out uh, remediation, so they need to be aware of what's going on, and they need to be aware that claims can be made against them. You've got the whole government review of Part 2A. Who knows exactly what it's going to cover? 
But what we do know is that these sorts of claims can go ahead and will go ahead in the future. The Corby case is good law, and so you do need to be aware as how how you manage a land contamination site. That is a very quick run through uh, some of the issues from my perspective on the Corby case.